We come to our last, sec uh, our last panel of the day, and uh, thank you for your patience, and I'm sorry once again for everything thank running you. late. So this is the last one. It's Gateway to Entrepreneurship and the World, Best Practices to Attract Investors. We have two of our panelists, John Panett. John, John Panett is the partner at Eisner Advisory Group and he's in charge of the National Technology and Life Sciences Group at Eisner. He has 35 years of public accounting experience with a strong emphasis on public and private life sciences and technology companies. Navneet Chug is a managing partner of Chug LLP, founded in 1985. He's an attorney and a CPA, and he's a graduate of Senior Executive Leadership Program from Harvard University. Welcome and we look forward to hearing from both of them. John, uh, is this happy hour? Yes. <laughs> Are we gonna talk about technology and global stuff or, or should we talk about life? <laughs> we should probably talk about mix and mix. Uh, some food that would be good accompaniment for some glass of wine, maybe some beer. What do you think? Indian beer? Indian beer, sure. Well, you know, when it's 5 p.m. and the organization doesn't know what they're doing and they delay the program by half an hour and it's a small group, we should have a chit-chat, no? Like about life and Priyanka Chopra. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's Global Connect, if you ask me. She moved from Bollywood to Hollywood. So we should have a round table session on life. And there's mental anxiety. Everybody, who has long COVID? Because I do. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, what's your question? What's the purpose of life? Oh my God. <laughs> we won't be going anywhere today. John, this question's for you. What's the purpose of life? <laughs> The purpose of life is to finish this panel as quickly as possible and get to the happy hour. <laughs> what do you think is the purpose of life? Uh, happiness. happiness. And are you happy? Okay. You're okay. You want to be more happy? Because we have a guru here on this panel who uh, advises people on how to be happy. George? <laughs> That, that's a good one. You know, happiness is very relative, and there are so many things in life, but you do need the happiness and you need the right perspective. And uh, that can help you through ups and downs of life. I can tell you from experience. So just when you think you're happy, something's gonna change, right? So there's some outside factor that's gonna come into play and mess up the equilibrium. So now you have to rebalance your happiness and something's got to give, something's got to come in, but that's what happens. Um, kind of read and react, go forward. So the interesting thing was we were going to talk about, so John was going to talk about access to global funding, and Navneet was going to talk about defining success. So stick well, on the two topics, but you know, we can talk about life right in between. You know? so, so will global funding make you happy if you got the funding? I guess that'll make you happy, right? So, so you've, got your, you've got your startup, you need to raise money. Just heard a great presentation there, right, about you know, access in the entire world, um, you know, looking, at, looking at your advisors. So a really great topic there, I thought. So one of the things that we see, so in addition to my work at Eisner, I'm also an angel investor. And so one of the things I can tell you that we see when companies come in to present quite, quite often is an entrepreneur who will talk about their company and talk about their science. And you look at the depth of the management team and you sort of say, this team can never execute this plan. We should end the conversation right now. There's no point in going further. Even if it's great science, a great idea, terrific TAM, um, you know, could be a game-changing technology, but if this team can't do it, I've either got to find a new team or I've got to just pass. And that's really hurtful. Uh, and I would also say, from my point of view, the canyon between the haves and the have-nots has gotten wider and deeper. 
So if you're in the halves column, you're in great shape. You're seeing tremendous Series A, Series B size rounds being done. And if you're in the have not column, you're in deep trouble because uh, your uncle can only back you for so long. So uh, finding those advisors, I thought that was a great visual on that slide to say you really need to find some help and some thoughts to help uh, make those connections. Want to add anything to that? So, so basically we're saying there's not enough money in the United States. We need to go outside U.S. to find money. <laughs> uh, you need to look everywhere, um, but you've got to have a really good story. Um, so so I'll, I'll relate another quick story for you. So I had a chance to introduce an entrepreneur uh, who I didn't know very well to one of the uh, original sort of the godfathers of the biotech industry. So the, one of the fellows who was the, one of the founders of Celgene, uh, guy's a gazillionaire at this point in time. And so this entrepreneur um, is desperate to meet him, wants to introduce his technology to him, wants this, this tremendously wealthy, uh, legendary character to invest in his company. And he starts the conversation off with, okay, so you know a cell has a wall around it and there's stuff inside the cell and the wall protects it. And I'm thinking as an accountant, this is really good, it takes me back to my biology course I took in college, which I've forgotten all about. I'm gonna write this down. But then you realize he's talking to somebody who wrote the book on this stuff, you know, 80 years earlier. So it was a really good case of really not knowing your audience and having the entirely wrong pitch. So sort of the word of advice would be is, do your homework before you talk to an investor, wherever they may be located. Make sure they're relevant to what you're asking for. Make sure they've got an active fund, they're investing in your category, and make sure your pitch is tailored to that type of conversation. So. You know, the one thing I want to add to what he said about knowing the source of funding. Even though I'm an engineer, I come from a finance background. And we used, we used to money, uh, manage money for billionaires and uh, extremely rich people. One of the things that I always had to do was, before we went to meet a client, we did every bit of research on them, not just their bios, but including, you know, f right from where do they live to what are the common touch points. And the, one of the things that I've always learned, especially with investors, it may be the school that they went to, you know, find some level of commonality between them and it, it works phenomenally because it's a great icebreaker when you first go in before you start your pitch and all that. It's a great icebreaker and, uh, you know, you get them already, you know, you, you've already found something that's common between them and you. Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. Um, and, and that's where those, having those advisors that can really be helpful to open those doors so sending a cold email to you know, info at vc.org is uh, really not gonna work. So again, that's a good example of the have nots, right? So you have no connection, um, you have no permission, um, they have no obligation to read, um, and they probably won't. So you really need to find ways to get those connections. And, and that part of it is, you know, is essential that those people also buy in. So, sticking a little bit with the biotech theme. So there's a legendary character that many people will know who's had awesome success in his labs, which is uh, Bob Langer out of MIT up in Boston. Um, he's, he has spawned hundreds of companies and, and some tremendous technologies. And he's been fortunate enough to be asked to sit on um, hundreds of boards. So it's sort of like you know, so he's on your board, but does he actually even know who you are, or did you just give him like a pile of equity just to sort of put, put the resume out there, you know? So having like meaningful uh, contacts who can really open those doors is really helpful, not just a resume stuffer. My turn? You gotta share. Gotta share, okay. So uh, what is success is the topic uh, so I guess human beings have been around for 300,000 years, and the first 150,000 years, uh, human beings didn't even wear clothes. Uh, 
Are and you it, making a suggestion? I'm making a suggestion. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> this group right now could use about anything. <laughs> um, okay, and so around 1500, 1600, 1700, 1800, everybody is poor, right? Everybody is in agriculture. There is not much of an inequality in income. So all this un inequality and all of this only happens after 1800. Uh, I always joke that the per capita income throughout the world in 1800 was the same. Okay, so now we have success. We made a lot of progress. Everything we do all day long, everything we use from the phone to the podium to the microphone, all of this happened in the last 100 years. And now, of course, there's inequality. Um, so let's look at all of the richest, most successful, from a money point of view, people in the world. What are they doing? They start a company, make a lot of money, and then they start a charity, and then they start doing social work. Because after a while, they realize how many steaks are you going to use, eat, and how many houses you're going to live in. So then they start doing charity work. So uh, one of the ways to define success is, imagine you're already successful, and now you're doing some charity work. Isn't that great? So what is the best charity work we could be doing in life right now and still making money and where is there a vacuum in the world that we could service and have mental satisfaction, have the life's purpose and meaning and somebody asks a question of what am I doing, why are we here, happiness, it answers all of those questions. So the biggest vacuum in the world right now, I know you have enough problems in life but I'm going to add another one in your life today. And this problem is called the global south versus global north divide. So there's about 192 countries in the planet, half of them are in the global north and half of them are in the global south. And this is just not geography north and south. There are some exceptions. There are some countries in the global south that are rich, maybe seven of them. But it's literally a huge divide between everything between the countries in the north of the equator and south of the equator. So south of global south is Asia and Latin America and Africa. So look at the stark divide in the middle of the earth. 192 countries, about half on top, half at the bottom. 60% of the world lives, um, rather 80% of the world lives in the global south although heavy population countries are in the south. All of Europe, 48 countries of Europe, is only 500 million people. So 20% of the world lives in the global north and 80% of the global south. 60% of the world GDP of about $100 trillion is in the global north. So 20% of the world is enjoying 60% of the world GDP. The bottom 80% of the world is enjoying 40% of the world GDP. This 40%, by the way, 20 years ago was 10%. That's how much progress we've made in the last 20, 25 years, primarily because of China. So why, why is there a global divide? Past colonialism, the northern countries used to own almost all of the southern countries. There is low income in the global south. There's dense and heavy population. They're low in resources. Whatever resources they have are not being exploited. There's income inequality. The north has democracy, political and economic freedom. The south does not have the industrialization and technology that happened in the global north. Education is lower. Literacy rate is lower in the global south. And Global South has too much religion dramas that you all know of, and too much agriculture. And of course, the Global South doesn't have the infrastructure that Global North has. All of these 10 problems is the way you make money. If Global South doesn't have infrastructure, if they don't have education, if they don't have political freedom, if they don't have re resources being utilized, every one of them is a way to make money. So one of the purposes we have in life, since 1800, where everybody was equally poor and equally rich, one of the purposes we have in life, all of us at Taikon, is to flatten the earth and make it more equal. 
500 years from now, the per capita income of every country will be exactly equal to the percentage of population in that country. It will be a beautiful world. US today has 4.5% of the world's population, but 22% of the world's wealth. 500 years from now, US will be at 8% of the world's population and 8% of the world's wealth. 500 years is what it's going to take to flatten the world. All of us can make it faster and, and do it quicker and make money in the meanwhile and be doing charity work at the same time. That's all. So um, I know we're kind of going to run up on time here a little bit. So um, just to kind of finish up a couple thoughts there as you're thinking about uh, the company and, and your pitch and things like that. So. Uh, we heard from some of the earlier conversations, uh, some of the earlier uh, discussion on putting the pitches together. So just a couple of thoughts that I see from, again, from the perspective of uh, both, both Eisner Amper and from the angel investor perspective. So one of the things that causes a conversation to end immediately is when asked the question and the response is, we have no competition. That's an immediate conversation ender because that's not true. Uh, regardless of where you are, and it may not even be somebody in your direct field. It could be somebody entirely in a different field looking at the same problem from an entirely different perspective. So um, knowing what everybody else is doing out there is a requirement of the entrepreneur going through their pitch. Um, another item I would say is command and control of your budget. So knowing exactly what, how much money you need to accomplish a specific example, a specific step in your process, in your growth, um, how long it's going to take, what are the key things that are going to have to happen for that to occur, and then what will happen after you spend that money and you reach that milestone, whatever that may be. So having really crisp command and control of that is important. Um, Another, another step I see a lot of entrepreneurs do, which I think is a, is a turn off, is when asked, how much is your raise? How much are you looking for? And the answer is, is well, how much do you write checks for? And I have, I have a pitch deck that'll address whatever you're looking to spend. That's the wrong answer. You have to tell me what you need to accomplish the objective, right? So, you have to be in command and control of that aspect. You can't, so if you're talking to somebody who you're in the wrong size range, then you didn't do your homework to George's point earlier about knowing who you're talking to, who your investor is up front. Okay. And then the final thing I would just say is, you know, if you do get the opportunity to speak with an investor and you've done your homework and you're talking to the right person and you've got your pitch down, you've got your command and control in place and they want to go forward, you have to be ready for their degree of diligence, whatever that's going to be. So you have to have your data room set up with all your documents, your basic financials, all your paperwork lined up there, your support for what you put in your projections. You know, if you're expecting growth to be X, Y, or Z based upon industry statistics, all of that should be at the ready so that you can turn that over immediately. Okay? And I'll say one last point, and now I'm going to turn it over to George, is so in the, in the course of a conversation, an initial conversation, if you say to an investor, we should stop this conversation because you need to sign an NDA, you've just stopped the conversation. The conversation goes no further. Right. So you have to have enough confidence in yourself and your story uh, and the system to be able to tease the investor to say, I want to learn more and I would be willing to sign at a deeper level of diligence, but at the start, if you're not willing to share, there's no reason to continue a conversation. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to you, George. Thank you, John. Navneet, since you started with a life lesson, I would like for you to close before I say my thank yous with some words of wisdom, something very short and concise. Yeah. Uh, Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> right. Uh, I think the, uh, the answer to this question, and it's a, like a 10-hour answer, but the one-minute one answer is that life's pretty useless. Uh, we all take it a little too seriously. 
I have a sign on my desk that says, this too shall pass. Uh, um, the sun's going to rise tomorrow, no matter what bad things happen today. And nobody really cares, and your life doesn't mean anything. Uh, except, my, except my dog. Except your dog, yeah. Dog, yeah, pets is a big drama, yeah. Uh, but I have proof, and I can prove to you right now how worthless our lives are. I guarantee you that your kids' grandchildren will, will not know your name. <laughs> guarantee. <laughs> okay, second test. 100, a current population is 8 billion. 108 billion people have lived and died. True number. Okay? Take a piece of paper and start writing down names of all of the people you know, dead or alive, and you cannot come up with more than 500 names. Even though your iPhone may have 3,000 contacts, you can't come up with more than 500 names. 108 billion people have died and you can't even come up with 500 names. That's how useless your life is. If you start living like this, there's so much peace and happiness. It's amazing. Well, John and Navneet, thank you so much for this incredibly great session. I really loved it. You know, and thank you for everything. And uh, thank you so much for attending Global Connect. Really appreciate it. And if any of you are interested, I think there is still a keynote going on in Hall D. So thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, apologies for, uh, for this thing running a little too late. Thank you.